Rizzo. Some people are so touchy. McLovin. What name? Who are you, Seal? Smash. Smile, man. It's gonna be a good year. What's a high school without a nickname? Well, if you ask Tony Clement, it might have been a whole lot easier at George S. Henry Secondary School in Toronto. He was known as Tony the Tory. And here's why. Tony's a Tory, all right? Uh, born in Manchester. He's a Man U fan, by the way, and uh, may be still seething about the whole losing the title thing. Now, his family immigrated to Ontario when Tony was four. His parents split up a few years later. His mom's got a job with the late Conservative MPP Bill Hodgson. Young Tony worked on Bill's campaign, hence the nickname. His mom also got remarried to a Conservative MPP John Clement. And when he was at university, Tony's conservative views flourished. And inspired by Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, he worked his way to several cabinet posts in the Ontario government. In 2006, he won his first federal race by a very narrow margin. As the Conservatives are going to form the next government. It's going to be a minority, not a majority. And since then, Tony's been an important player in the government. He was Minister of Health. As Industry Minister, he made the decision to keep potash in the Canadian control. In his latest post as President of the Treasury Board, he's found himself at times on the defensive. What with overtime for ministerial chauffeurs and the controversy over G8 spending and the G8 gazebo? No, we, we never decided anything at a private meeting. Despite the pressure, Tony continues to practice the guitar and also he's earned himself a new nickname, Tory Twitter King. Please welcome to the show, the Honorable Tony Clement. How are you? Good to How are you? I'm excellent, thank you. How's, How, how's it been going? I mean, it's been a, quite a time for you guys. We have been busy, yeah. uh, and we've had the budget, and we've had uh, the copyright bill. That's I know right. that's of interest to... Uh, your, uh, your audience, I'm sure, and a lot of other things besides. How, how's the budget process been for you? Uh, it's a bit, for me, my, my role was kind of more behind the scenes and uh, getting some of the choices that we made yeah. prepped and ready for the budget. So once it was out there, my role was done. Uh, but uh, you always are out there selling the budget and selling uh, the changes that we want to do. Do you have to... Look, I mean, I know that within the budget, I'm sure there's lots of things that you agree with. There's going to be lots of things that you don't agree with. But is it hard to sell something that you don't believe in? Uh, it, it would be, uh, I would think. I, I think you can always make the case, though, that uh, uh, you believe that it is going generally in the right direction. The things that were part of our campaign promises, well, you know, you campaigned on that. So you better, you better not have a crisis of conscience over those things. Sure. Other things that are happening, that some of the changes we're trying to do are connected to what we think is important for the economy and for job creation because we know how important that is going to be for the future or training uh, our young people and uh, uh, newcomers making sure that they are well trained to be absorbed into our economy these are things that are right. going to be important for the next generation as well what do you make of the criticism that omnibus bills to kind of subvert the democratic process because you're just jamming a bunch of things in there's no real doesn't feel like there's a real democratic process to them what do you make of that I would say this, uh, this particular bill will have more debate than any other uh, bill, a budget bill, in the last 20 years. So there's, there's going to be a lot of debate in Parliament. Uh, and you have to also consider that we, we, did, we were all over the country before the, the, the budget was even introduced. We were all over the country doing round tables and town hall meetings and so on. So, you know, I, I think that, that argument is overplayed a little bit. Well, I mean, the fact that there'll be lots of debate is almost irrelevant in the sense that a budget bill the party has to vote along the party lines, that an MP doesn't have the ability to not go with a budget, really. As Wilkes found out, he can't even talk about the budget in a critical way without getting shut down big time. Well, I, I think we have a lot of opportunity for free votes. Uh, we do. Uh, and we have a lot of opportunity for debate. But the budget is kind of the, the major economic document of a, uh, of a government. Mm -hmm. And if you are having a crisis of conscience about the budget, you should really rethink whether you're on the right side of Parliament or not. No, fair enough. But that's why I bring the idea of the omnibus bill, that, yeah. they, that, they, that they put a lot of things in this budget bill that perhaps need, some of these things need to be separate. Right. You that's, know, that's the that, argument. That's the argument, yeah. Yeah. And, and indeed, uh, I believe that we are creating a situation where the environmental aspects of the bill mm -hmm. will have a separate subcommittee, and I, I think that is important to do. Uh, but at the end of the day, we have an opportunity to debate and then deliberate and vote. And I would say that a lot of the things that are found in the budget were found in our campaign platforms. So there was a lot of debate around the country before the last election. When something like Wilkes happens, where he stands up as an MP and he says what he said on camera, um, is, is there a chill that comes in the room? Like you, you see it. What, what happens? What's your reaction as an MP? Well, I, I just think uh, I, I haven't talked to him. Um, I think sometimes you get into situations where you say things in an ill, inelegant way 
And afterwards, when you think about it, you say, that really wasn't what I was trying to get across. And it, this may have been one of those situations. But look, we, we've got to do jobs. We've got to, it's kind of a funny job we have. We have to represent our constituents. Uh, we have to be part of a team that put forward a platform in the last election. And that's true of all the other parties as well. Uh, and we have to be true to our own uh, values and principles. You know, as soon as you said, though, that you try to represent your constituents, that some people watching under the breath went gazebo. You know that they said that as it relates to you, right? Is it, and when you got caught up in that sort of swarm, what was that like for you just as a person? Um, I, it was frustrating because uh, a lot of the attacks were not very accurate uh, and uh, they were later found out to be not consequential or not accurate. So you're, you're in this kind of media fire, firestorm for a while, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, I, I could do a lot of things with my life, George. I, I, I was in business before. I, I uh, had a law degree. Uh, I, I was doing some teaching at the, at the university. If you're not making an impact in a positive way to help your country, then go, go away. Because, you know, in that sense, right. you're, you're, not, you're, you're not fulfilling what you want to do with your time. So I still feel I'm doing things that are going to be helpful to our country. As a guy in cabinet, you can do that. Do you think a regular MP feels that way as they're fresh? And, I, and this is not a yeah. criticism, by the way, of the Harper government, because I know that this, is, this has been a criticism of several prime ministers in the past, that if you're a backbencher, you can't really do anything. I disagree with that completely. Uh, first of all, you have the power of being in a caucus. And uh, in our caucus, just I'm sure in every other caucus, you can, you can have an impact on the direction of your party or your government. That's the first thing. Secondly, you have the power to introduce a private member's bill. So, yeah, I mean, you sometimes you've got to make a lemonade out of the lemons, uh, but there's lots of opportunities as a backbench MP to have impact. You have to be imaginative and you have to uh, have the guts and you also have to just keep at it uh, for long periods of time. What's the biggest lear time? learning curve you've had in this job? What have you learned the most in the last little while? Oh, um, you're, you're throwing a lot of information. Um, a lot of the time and you have to distill that information very quickly uh, and be able to articulate that. Uh, I've learned uh, social media that w you know when I started as an MP six years ago what's what's social media? And, You're awesome uh, on Twitter you like you speak your mind when you call that kid a jackass I laugh <laughs> because listen I, I get you shouldn't call a 15 year old kid a jackass but if you do something that he thinks is a jackass move then call yeah. him a jackass. Right. First of all I didn't know he was 15 years old at the time <laughs> that's my defense he apologized to me I apologized to him <laughs> right. I learned a little lesson about uh, about uh, d d direct messages which can be photographed <laughs> Uh, and uh, and dis disseminated, so we all we all learn uh, that. But uh, the, the thing about that I like about Twitter in particular, because I'm more of a Twitter guy than a Facebook guy, is very immediate. You can actually have an online dialogue with people all over the country or all over the world. Uh, and uh, as, as you know, it's a great disseminator of information and a great way to learn uh, sure. about the ver the debates that are going on. It's incredible how you know I, you know you, you you talk about Twitter now. And I remember when I was a kid, I used to write the House of Commons and request Hansard reports, like the, the, the what you had to go through to yeah. get involved in political back then was a little bit more work and today it's just it's so many more options for a kid to be politically engaged. I want to play you some. Let's go back to this. I think it's 1975. Watch this clip here. Good evening. The Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario, which has held a firm grip on this province through 32 years and nine provincial elections, has just squeaked into power tonight with a minority of seats in the Ontario legislature. It's a provincial election, 1975. That was an impactful election on your life, wasn't it? It was indeed. Um, my mother, a uh, single mom, raising uh, me a young lad, 14 mm -hmm. years of age, uh, uh, her boss was re-elected um, as a PC member of provincial parliament uh, and uh, at the same on the same night uh, my future stepfather was defeated as the ca as a cabinet minister he was the attorney general he's of Ontario the, he's the Clement and he's the Clement uh, yeah. and Tony Clement and uh, and uh, he uh, he's John Twining Clement uh, he's the poor Twining tea guy uh, and uh, he he was defeated on that night and uh, three years later my mother and uh, him were married and so she was a part of the political process in that way. You're just working there, right? Yeah, she was working at Queen's Park, uh, admin assistant uh, kind of role, and uh, just trying to put food on the table for herself and her kid. And uh, and that's how I got involved in politics because it's kind of if she if her boss lost the election, she was out of a job. Right. You, you were on that campaign. Did you campaign? I I, I stuffed envelopes and <laughs> delivered leaflets and 
did all the entry-level stuff and, uh, of course, the political bug bit at that point. So if she was working for a liberal, you might have been a liberal now. Well, I tell the story uh, that... Uh, well, God forbid for you, a new Democrat. Yeah, yeah. A year before that, <laughs> yeah. a friend of mine at the time said, hey, you know, uh, David Lewis is having a barbecue. <laughs> Would you like to come along? I said, nah, I'm good. But I always wonder, you know, if I'd gone to the David Lewis barbecue, would right. I be a rabid NDPer right now? You might be. <laughs> Who knows? So now people are beginning to understand this is why you're Tony the Tory, because you were brainwashed as a kid. <laughs> 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 oh, now I've done it. Now I've done it. You know, the, um, the funny thing is that, I mean, you are a Tory Tory, and I know that sometimes the media refers to this Conservative Party as the Tories, but it's not the Tory Party. It's a different, it's a different version of the Conservative Party. How have you changed as a Conservative over the years? Because this definition of Conservative in power is slightly different, or even right. some would say more drastically different from maybe what you're used to as an Ontario Tory. Well, you know, it's funny you should say that. I, I do believe uh, that um, one always has to put a little water in the wine when you're governing. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get everything you want 100% of the time on day one. And uh, I know this may surprise your audience, but I, I think actually Stephen Harper uh, is, is uh, balanced on these issues. You know, when we look at uh, the budget, for instance, uh, people were expecting 60,000 uh, public sector jobs lost and tens of billions of dollars cut, and none of that happened. And we're familiar with the idea of, you know, where are they now, the where are they now story. Where, where, whatever happened to the Red Tories? Where did they go? <laughs> well, I, look, I think that uh, we still have in our party a, a diversity of kind of a, spe a spectrum mm -hmm. of people. But yeah, I think that the times change too. Uh, I, I will put it to you that if Bill Davis, the kind of the archetypal yeah. red Tory from Ontario, uh, if he were active politically now, I think he would be pretty well where we are. One of the big criticisms of this particular government is the idea of transparency and the lack thereof. And even though that it had been determined that the money for the G8 spending went for intended use, there was still a lot of criticism with a lack of transparency yeah. in that. And, the, uh, and I what, agree with that. Yeah, yeah you know, uh, and I wasn't in charge of that decision. Uh, but, uh, no, I think we, we learn every Auditor General's report that comes out, we learn something that we can apply better uh, for the future. And I think we have to look at new ways to be more transparent. That's an ongoing thing, and we learn from our critics, but we can also learn ourselves. And one of the one of the files I'm in charge of is open government, so we can find ways. You know, how do we how do we open up? I've got 272,000 data sets online now that, that that were publicly funded data sets weren't available online before. I think that's better government. Certainly, All right, stick around. We got more of a conversation. I want to find out who his closest friend in opposition is, and we'll get into some music as well. Anthropology with the Honorable Tony Clement next. The youth wing is the fastest growing section of the Provincial Conservative Party. Province-wide, the PC party attracts more young people than either the Liberals or the NDP. Campuses generally are, are much more conservative. Students are more career-oriented. They're worried about the deficit uh, and, and other economic issues because basically the governments that have, uh, that have governed for the past 20 years have mortgaged our future through their deficits and through excessive spending. We're back with the Honorable Tony Clement. You've been doing this for a long time. Uh, the CBC archives are going to be the death of me. No, no. Maybe that's why you guys had all the cutbacks. <laughs> that's why, because we have one you guys on record. All right, who's your closest friend in the opposition benches? I would say Dominic LeBlanc. Yeah? Yeah. What do you guys talk about? Well, we, we went to university together, so we, we have a lot of shared memories. All right. How do you feel about attack ads? Do they, are they, you know, I mean, they're certainly prevalent. You guys are really into them. I disagree with attack ads, but I do agree with contrast ads. Right. Contrast ads. Okay, here's my follow-up question. Is contrast ad just a different way of saying attack ads? <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> I, no, think, I think it's fair to they're, they're talk about your policy and to say, here's what we believe, here's what we think the other guys believe. Uh, 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 compare and contrast and vote. But do you think it's fair to do that when you're the government and you're spending money when you are the government against a new candidate or a new leader? Like, is that, is that the right use? Well, you see, we're, we're a political party, so we, we get to spend money as a political party, not, not, not a political as a government. party, you're yeah. the government. Right, but we have a political party that, whose job it is to think 24-7 about how to get us re-elected. On the other side, you have the opposition parties whose job it is 24-7 to think about how to kick us out of office and to get elected. Right. So that's all part of the marketplace of ideas. And so it's okay to do that? I think as long as you're not lying about somebody or uh, t doing personal attacks, I think that's fine. So you've probably seen the controversy and seen this painting right here. Is it true that with the government, did you buy it? 
Because <laughs> it was an anonymous well, buyer, was it, it you? Was, uh, no, it was not me, and uh, I, I'm saddened to see the dog because I know uh, the Prime Minister's a cat lover. He's a cat lover. <laughs> um, what's your favorite CBC show other than this one? Hockey Night in Canada? Bingo. Easy answer. <laughs> it's like saying, oh, yeah, that's a too easy an answer. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite Radiohead album? Oh, I would go back to the Benz. Oh, that's so great, isn't it? It is indeed. You know, much is made about, you hear a lot of people, especially people who talk about the family values conversation, talk about the importance of a strong home and a mother and a father, and you hear that conversation. But as a guy who's raised by a single mom, mm -hmm. what's the thing that you value the most about your mom and what she gave you? Uh, she uh, instilled in me uh, the value of hard work. And uh, I think also, you know, uh, being optimistic, like, you know, to, to try, try to raise a child uh, single-handedly and to put, keep it all together, keep, you know, working and keep the home life sane. And at a time, too, culturally, where it was still, you know, there was a stigma attached to it. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sure it wasn't easy for her. Uh, you know, I kind of picture her as a kind of a Mary Tyler Moore type, if you will, you know, mm -hmm. going into a male-dominated office space and... Uh, and having to fight her way to, uh, to stability. So, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, she was an optimistic person, and she uh, also instilled in me a bit of, you know, you have to be a bit stubborn. Uh, don't, not pig-headed, but, mm -hmm. you know, it's, people aren't going to hand you anything on a platter. We never had anything handed to us on a platter. Mm -hmm. and, but, but you can work hard and get ahead in this country. I agree with you, absolutely. All right, the Honorable Tony Clement, President of the Treasury Board, Minister as well for the Federal Economic Development Agency for Northern Ontario. Good to see you, man. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Flourished and inspired by Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, he worked his way to several cabinet posts in the Ontario government. In 2006, he won his first federal race by a very narrow margin. As the Conservatives are going to form the next government. It's going to be a minority, not a majority. And since then, Tony's been an important player in the government. He was Minister of Health. As Industry Minister, he made the decision to keep potash in the Canadian control. Born in Manchester, he's a Man U fan, by the way, and uh, may be still seething about the whole losing the title thing. Now, his family emigrated to Ontario when Tony was four. His parents split up a few years later, his mom's got a job with the late Conservative MPP Bill Hodgson. Young Tony worked on Bill's campaign, hence the nickname. His mom also got remarried to a Conservative MPP John Clement. And when he was at university, Tony's Conservative view role. In his latest post as President of the Treasury Board, he's found himself at times on the defensive. What with overtime for ministerial chauffeurs and the controversy over G8 spending and the G8 gazebo? No, we, we never decided anything at a private meeting. Despite the pressure, Tony continues to practice the guitar and also he's earned himself a new nickname. Tory Twitter King. Who's welcome to the show? The Honorable Tory Clement. How are you? Good to How are you? I'm excellent. Thank How you. How's it been? How, how's it been going? I mean, it's been a, quite a time for you guys. We have been busy. Yeah. Uh, and we've had the budget, and we've had uh, the copyright bill. I that's know right. that's of interest to uh, your uh, your audience, I'm sure, and a lot of other things. Rizzo. Some people are so touchy. McLovin. What name? Who are you, Seal? Smash. Smile, man. It's gonna be a good year. What's a high school without a nickname? Well, if you ask Tony Clement, it might have been a whole lot easier at George S. Henry Secondary School in Toronto. He was known as Tony the Tory. And here's why. Tony's a Tory, all right?